Philippians chapter 3. We are in Philippians chapter 3 today as we continue our sermon series that we have entitled Connecting the Dots. And the thinking behind this sermon series goes like this. Uh, We're connecting the dots between the gospel and your life. Many of us, uh, if you grew up in the church or if you've been coming to church for a while or even if you don't go to church much at all but you just grew up in this culture that is the Bible Belt, most of us with that kind of a background have some idea of what the good news of the gospel is. If you gave us a written test and asked that question, what is the gospel, most of us would be able to put down something to the effect of the gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Or if you've been coming here to Redeemer for a while, you may write something down like, uh, the gospel is the good news that Jesus lived the life that I should have lived and died the death that I should have died so that I can have a relationship with God. Some answer like that, and that would be correct. Most of us would be able to give an answer to that question, what is the gospel? And most of us believe that that good news should make a difference in our everyday lives. However, if you ask that question on the test, how exactly does that good news of the gospel make a difference in your everyday lives, we have trouble connecting those dots. We have trouble with that. We might say, well, I know I'll go to heaven when I die, but how does that make a difference in it? Well, I go to church. I know I'm supposed to be reading my Bible and praying. There's supposed to be some stuff that I... But we don't have a really good answer to that question. So what we're doing in this sermon series is each week I'm going to share with you uh, an event or a situation or some occurrence from my everyday life. And then we'll do some teaching on the gospel and walk through the scripture and, and learn or be reminded of some things about the good news of the gospel. And then we will connect those dots. We will apply that teaching to the situation that we talked about at the beginning And in so doing that, week after week, our prayer has been that we would develop that skill, that we would, as the people of God, learn to connect the gospel to our everyday lives, that we would develop gospel instincts so that we would be people in this place who are driven by the good news of the gospel. So let's do that together today, an event from my life, an occurrence, a situation Uh, something uh, that the gospel has made a difference that I've learned to apply the gospel to. When I was 12 or 13 years old, my dad left my mom and moved out of our home to pursue a relationship with another woman who had a son about my age. As you might imagine, this was very hard on my family. It was hard on my mom. It was hard on my younger sister. And it was a very hard time for me. I suppose people with different uh, temperaments respond differently in situations like that. Uh, But for me, I don't remember making a conscious decision, but I don't think there's any doubt that in an attempt to feel more secure, I dedicated myself to being the kind of kid that anyone would want for a son. I dedicated myself to be a guy that everyone would want in their life, or at least accept in their life and not reject. And so in the culture that I grew up in, in a small town in Georgia, that meant to be accepted and to be popular and to not be rejected, I kept my hair cut and combed it, parted it, combed it over, you know, because that's what guys my age did. I was very polite. I said, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and please, and thank you. That's another thing that made you acceptable in the culture that I grew up in. I wore my shirt tucked in with a belt on because people liked that. In fact, I became, some folks say, I'm a, I was a snazzy dresser, that I worked hard on my outward appearance. But the point is that I always tried to appear put together, that I worked really hard to have it all together. I made good grades in school. I was elected by my classmates to student council. I was a leader in my youth group. I even went to Samford University on a full tuition scholarship. Samford University that many people refer to as the Harvard of the South. Now my girls say nobody calls it that except for you. But I'm pretty sure that I heard Paul von Herman or Catherine Thigpen say that uh, at, a, at a t- another time. They're grads too. So, But anyway, I digress. 
I graduated from Sanford, magna cum laude. I went to law school at the University of Georgia. I got a job in a law firm. I made partner as fast as uh, the fastest track that they had. I was succeeding in a very difficult area of the law. I had money. Um, I was successful. I had social standing. I was smart. Spiritually, I was a leader in my church. I served as a ruling elder. I was the clerk of the session. And if that wasn't enough, I left all that to go to seminary and to serve as a pastor. What else could you want in a son? What else could you want in a friend? Now, I know your story is different from mine, but we've all felt rejected at one time or another. And we've all worked hard to secure our place in this world through some means in one way or another. And so the question for us this morning is, does the good news of the gospel have anything to say in situations like that? How does the gospel apply when I succeed? How does it apply when I fail? How does it apply when I'm rejected? How does it apply when I am criticized? Let's take a few minutes in Philippians chapter 3 and hear the good news of the gospel again. I'm going to read verses 2 through 9. We're going to be especially looking at verse 3 and verse 9 today, so be listening for those as I read. Hear now God's word from Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone th- else thinks he has confidence, reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let's pray together as we come to God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, and I thank you that we live in a place that so many people can articulate what that good news is. Father, we confess that we know far more than we actually apply to our lives. So would you come now and be our teacher? Would you show us, would you help us to develop this skill of applying the good news of the gospel to our everyday lives? Please develop in us gospel instincts, that we might be a people who are driven every day at every moment by the good news of the gospel. And Father, I ask that you'd be willing to do that even through the sin-stained lips of a foolish preacher. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. When he writes this letter to the church at Philippi, he is in prison, probably in Rome. And the Philippian church has sent him a gift. And he is writing, this is basically a thank you note. He's writing back to the church at Philippi. He's heard some of the things that are going on there. And he's addressing those things that he hears that is going on. And he sends this letter to them. And he's giving them some warnings as he comes to chapter 3. And in verse 2, you, says, you see he says, look out for the dogs. He's not talking about the University of Georgia, right? No, I know, I'm sure you're worried about that, but he's not. He's talking about a group of people who are telling folks that they have to do certain things in order to be made right with God, that they have to do certain things outwardly in order to be a part of the people of God. And Paul's saying, look out for those people 
who tell you that by doing good things you can make yourself acceptable to God or by doing things you can make yourself a part of the people of God. He's talking specifically about the ancient tradition of circumcision here. But really, his argument would apply to anything that you think that by doing this, I have standing with God. By doing this, I'll be acceptable to God. By doing this thing, then I'll be a part of the people of God. Paul's saying, watch out for people who tell you that. Verse 3, Paul says, For we are the real circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and watch this, and put no confidence in the flesh. This struck me this week. Listen to what Paul is saying. He's saying that Christians, people who are in Christ, who belong to Christ, that Christians are people who put no confidence in their flesh. Paul is saying that Christians do not rely on the good things that we do or the good things that we achieve, the successes in our life, that we don't rely on the good things that we think, we don't rely on the good things that we say, we don't rely on the good things that we write in order to make us right with God or acceptable to God. That's the declaration he's making here in verse 3. We'll come back to that and unpack that more in a moment. In verses 4 through 6, Paul points out if anyone has any reason to rely on the good things that they do, uh, their successes, the good things they achieve, the good things they think, the good things they say, if anybody relies on those things, Paul says, I have more of a reason. And in verses 5 through 6, Paul gives a very impressive resume. Maybe not in the culture that I grew up in. I described to you what mine was in the culture I grew up in. But the culture he grew up in, he gives a very impressive resume. And Paul basically says at the end of that, I have a better resume than your resume, and I don't put my confidence in my resume. I don't put my confidence in my flesh. I'm not trusting in looking to those things to make me right with God or acceptable to God or a part of the people of God. In verses 7 through 8, Paul says that he's willing to lose all those things that he's gained in order to gain Christ. He says that knowing Jesus is the greatest thing and that all that other stuff is trash, is rubbish in comparison. Now, he's not saying that those things that he achieved are bad things. Other places he writes... And it's good. He's grateful that he's a part of the tribe of Judah, of the people of Benjamin. He's grateful that he is a Pharisee, that he knows the law, that he's a Hebrew, that he was all those things he's grateful for. Those are good things. He's just saying in comparison to knowing Christ, they're rubbish, they're trash. The word is actually stronger than that. He's actually saying it, it, it's it's dung it's excrement compared to knowing christ and when you compare them knowing christ is much better than having all the success and all the notoriety that he had and then paul says this in verse 9 this is that verse that we said we want to focus on he says that he wants to gain christ verse 9 and be found in him that is to be found in christ not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that, that righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul's saying very clearly there that he does not rely on the good things that he does, the good things he's achieved, his successes. He doesn't rely on the good things that he thinks or says or writes to make him right with God or acceptable to God, that that's not what he does. Instead, Paul says he relies on, he places his confidence in a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. He said is it, a, it is a righteousness from God. It's not his own. It's a righteousness from God, and it comes through faith. Now, if you're anything like me, I read passages like this, and I think, well, that's good for Paul, right? I mean, he's in prison, and he's writing, y'all ought to rejoice. These very folks in Philippi, he had been in a Philippian jail singing hymns. They know what Paul is like. 
And so I'm tempted to think this is for exceptional Christians. This is for the Apostle Paul. Of course, he responds that way. This is how apostles respond. This is how really special, mature Christians respond. But you need to know that in verse 15, Paul says, all of us who are mature in Christ should think this way. Or look at verse 17. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul's calling this church to live this way, to imitate him, to imitate all those who don't put their confidence in the flesh, who are not establishing their own righteousness, but look to have this righteousness from God that comes by faith in Christ. In chapter 4 and verse 9, he says it again. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the grace of God will be with you. The God of all peace will be with you, he says. So there's no exception that this is just for mature people. Paul calls us all who are mature in Christ to imitate his example and to live in this way. All right, so let's connect the dots. Let's spend some time. That was short on the gospel teaching, longer on application, right? Because we all know more than we probably apply to our lives anyway, right? So let's spend a little more time than usual on our application. Connecting the dots. We've said we all have felt rejected in some way. That we've all felt the need for acceptance, to belong, or at least to be desired. We've all felt the need for affirmation or at least understanding. You understand me and appreciate me, even if you don't agree with me. We've all felt the need for security, to know that we'll be okay. And we all look to secure our place in the world through some means. And we often bring this same approach to how we look for security in the world. We bring the same approach to gain acceptance from God. I told you how I did that and why I think I did that. You need to do some thinking about how you approach God and why you do that. What it is that you look to for security, to know that you'll be okay to secure your place in this world. What means do you use for do, to do that? And it's usually something that we do. Our resume, things we, our flesh does. The good things that we do or say or think, the things that I'm good at. And of course, it's understandable that this is the way we would approach God. We've never really known anything else. From the time that we're smaller, if you're good and sit still in the dentist chair, you get to get a prize out of the treasure chest, right? When you're in school, if you do well, you get good grades. If you do well in school, you get more school or you get a better job. If you do well at your job, you get a raise or you get a bonus or you get a promotion. All of life, we're rewarded based on our performance, based on our righteousness that we build. So it's understandable that we come to God that way. And we attempt to secure our standing with God the same way we look to secure our place in the world. But let's connect the dots. Look what Paul says in verse 2. He says, watch out. Look out for those people who tell you that by doing the right things, you can make yourself acceptable to God. <laughs> That's exactly what we do. And Paul's saying, watch out for people who tell you that. Be careful when people tell you that. Or in verse 3, he says that Christians are people who put no confidence in the flesh. That Christians don't rely on the good things we do or achieve or our successes or the good things we think or say to make us right or acceptable to God. And we do that all the time. Or in verse 9 where he says that he's not trying to build or establish his own righteousness, a righteousness of his own that comes from the good things that he does. But he is clinging to, puts his confidence in, is relying on this righteousness that comes from God through his faith in Christ. That's convicting to me. I don't know if it is to you. Because we all attempt to do this and approach God in this way. We must, if we're going to have a relationship with God, if we're going to be a part of the people of God, we must come to the place that we say, I've been told in the culture that I live in that I have to do good things in order to be accepted. 
In fact, I've even told myself that, that I'll be okay with God because of these things that I do. We must come to the place that we say, I've been putting my confidence in my own flesh, and Christians don't do that. I've been trying to build a righteousness of my own, but there's a righteousness that comes from God, and it comes through faith in Christ. And we must come to the place that we say, I want to follow Paul's example. I want to imitate his way of life. I want to live that way. Now, once we make that confession, what difference does that make in our life? This is the answer to that question. What difference does the gospel make in our area? We're answering that question now. What difference does it make in my life? Think about it with me. If I am, as verse 3 says, putting my confidence in my own flesh and what I can do, if I am, as verse 9 says, relying on establishing my own righteousness to be accepted and have security, then what happens when I fail at something? I'm crushed. I'm devastated. Why? Because I feel like I must succeed, that I must have success in order to be acceptable. I feel like, and I've been told by my culture, and I've even told myself that I must get the part. I must get the job. I must get into the school. I must get into the fraternity of the sorority. I must get elected to the position. I must get the date. I must get the second date. I must get the promotion in order to be accepted. My identity, my security, my, as Paul says, my righteousness depends on my success. So if I fail, I'm devastated. I'm crushed. I'm unacceptable. I'm insecure. What happens when I have success? Think about that with me. If I'm putting my confidence in my own flesh, we think the answer is to be successful, right? If we're relying on establishing our own righteousness to be accepted and have security, and then we have success, what does that do? Think about it. I become prideful, arrogant. Oh, I won't show it because I want to be nice about it. But if we're honest... If we, think about it, if you're establishing your own righteousness, then what does that make you? It makes you self-righteous. That's right. And when I succeed, I look down on others when they don't succeed. I judge you. I was able to do it and overcome all these obstacles. Why can't you do it? And when I succeed, if I'm trusting, if I'm putting my confidence in my own flesh, if I'm relying on establishing my own righteousness to be accepted and have security, when I succeed, then all of a sudden I feel entitled. I feel like I'm owed acceptance and respect and security because after all, I have earned it. And if I don't get the acceptance and respect and security I feel like I've earned, I am angry and bitter. And when I do get it, I'm prideful and judgmental. One more. What happens when I'm criticized? (laughs) Think about it. If I'm putting my confidence in my flesh and what I can do, if I am, as verse 9 says, establishing my own righteousness, I'm working to establish it through what I can do, what happens when I'm criticized? (laughs) I'm defensive. I'm not open to correction. I counterattack to overcome what is seen as an attack on me, as an attack on my righteousness that I'm working really hard to build in my flesh. And in that moment, I feel I must do whatever it takes to defend my righteousness because I must have that righteousness in order to be acceptable, in order to secure my place in this world. That's how we respond to criticism. If we have confidence 
in our flesh, if we're attempting to establish, if any of those things describe you, don't think about other people. That describe, I hope so and so's here in this. No. If any of that applies to you, think about it in your life. The Holy Spirit will apply it to somebody else. If any of that applies to you, then perhaps you're putting confidence in your own flesh. Perhaps you are relying on establishing your own righteousness to be accepted or to secure your place in the world. But what difference does it make? If we begin to say with Paul, listen, as a Christian, I am one who glories in Christ and I put no confidence in my flesh. By the way, that's a big thing to do, isn't it? That's hard. If with Paul we say, look, I am not trusting in my own righteousness. I admit I have no righteousness of my own, but I have a righteousness that comes from God through my faith in Christ. What difference does that make? Well, what happens when I fail at something? Let's be honest, I'm disappointed. I wanted to succeed, but I'm not crushed. I wanted the part, I wanted the job, I wanted the date, but I don't have to have it in order to be acceptable. I don't have to have it in order to be secure. That's not my life. My righteousness does not depend on success in that area. I have a righteousness from God that comes through my faith in Christ, and as long as I am in Christ, then God is using all things, even this failure, for my good to make me look more like Jesus. So even in my failures, though I'm disappointed, I still have hope, and I'm not crushed. What happens when I succeed? What difference does the gospel make when we succeed, when we do achieve success? What difference does it make? I'm happy, but I'm not arrogant. I'm not self-righteous because my successes are not what matter most in my life. I don't feel entitled to anything because I have no confidence in my flesh. I don't have a righteousness of my own that I feel like would entitle me to something. I'm not judgmental of you. Because if I'm not establishing my righteousness of my own that enables me to look down on you when I succeed and you fail, and listen to me, this is very important, listen to me, it enables me perhaps for the first time to move toward other people and truly love them because I don't need anything from them. I don't have to get affirmation and acceptance. I don't have to make sure everybody seeing me serve this person. I don't have to make sure that you appreciate it. Because I'm not using my moving toward people, or let's just face it, I'm not using people in order to build my righteousness. And it enables us in many cases to move toward people and to truly love people for the first time. I don't have to have them appreciating me to make me feel like I've secured my place in the world. What happens when I'm criticized? But I'm confessing, listen, I'm not trusting in my flesh and what I can do. I'm not trying to establish my own righteousness. When I'm criticized, then I don't have to be so defensive. Because I'm not putting my confidence in my flesh. I can be more open to correction. Because I'm not trying to establish my own righteousness. I can be more objective. I can be more open to suggestions for improvement. Because I'm not anxious about proving my worth. I'm not anxious about proving myself to be acceptable. I'm not depending on what I can do in order to secure my place in the world. And for the first time, I might can actually take constructive criticism. The gospel makes a huge difference in our lives. When we succeed, when we fail, when we're criticized, there is a freedom that comes from not putting our confidence in our own flesh. There is such a freedom that comes from not having to have a righteousness of your own, but accepting by faith this righteousness that comes from God that makes you acceptable and gives you security. Oh, don't you want that kind of freedom? 
aren't you tired of carrying the burden of trying to establish and maintain your own righteousness? Be honest. Aren't you tired of the anxiety and the fear, constantly afraid that you'll be exposed, that people will figure out you don't really have it all, although you present as put together and you try to come across like you that you really don't have it all together? How long are you going to fight that fight of trying to convince everybody else you have it all together Why deep down you know that you don't? Oh, maybe in some areas you do. But none of us have it all together in every area of our life. Not all the time. Not in every area. Aren't you tired Aren't you weary of the burdens? Please hear the words of Jesus spoken to tired and weary people like you and tired and weary people like me. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I, will give you rest. Maybe you're here today and you've never thought of Christianity in this way. My prayer for you this week has been that you would hear this message and you would admit, I've been putting my confidence in my flesh and Christians don't do that. My prayer for you this week would be that you would stop trying to build your own righteousness And you would seek that righteousness from God that comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. That's been my prayer for you this week. But maybe you're here today and you have heard this message before. You have thought of Christianity in this way before. My prayer for you has been that you would again center your life on what God will give you And not center your life on what you try to earn. Let's commit ourselves to reminding ourselves of this truth every day. Let's commit to remind one another of this good news of the gospel. Let's pray and ask God to help us to remember that we might be people who have the good news of the gospel make a difference in our everyday lives. Let's pray and ask him to do that. Oh, Heavenly Father, we'll walk away from here and we'll forget these prayers. But we ask you to remember the next time we fail and we're crushed, the next time we succeed and we're arrogant or puffed up or judgmental or self-righteous, the next time we're criticized and we get defensive, oh, Holy Spirit, bring these words from the Scripture to our mind. That we're not people who put confidence in our flesh. That we are not establishing a righteousness of our own. But we have a righteousness from God that comes by faith, that makes us acceptable, that gives us security. Father, we ask you to remember. Holy Spirit, we ask you to work in our hearts and that you would help us to admit that we do put our confidence in our flesh and what we can do, that we are always trying to build our own righteousness. Help us to be honest with ourselves and honest with others about that. Only you can show that to us. No preacher or loved one can convince us of that. But Father, I ask for my friends and for my own heart that you would give us the freedom that comes from trusting in Jesus and walking in him and that righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Please free us up and and make us a people who experience that kind of freedom every day. That we might be a people who for the first time can actually move towards people without using them. But truly love them for your glory and for the good of our community. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.